We'll switch gears a little bit and talk now about stress reaction and stress fractures. So the pathophysiology here, we're going to have repetitive loading, which can alter structure. And we can actually see fatigue of the bone if that load continues without any rest. So etiology here, and this is some of the similarities you'll see with a number of these different pathologies, um, training errors. So increased mileage or frequency, again, old running shoes has been talked about in the literature with these folks as well. Biomechanical faults, one of the things that I think about most often is the lack of shock absorption. So when we hit the ground, regardless of how you do that, whether it's a rear foot strike, midfoot, or forefoot strike, we need to absorb ground reaction forces. We need to absorb shock. So if people aren't able to do that well, that load is going to be transferred up the kinetic chain. I think that very often that's a component of some of the stress fractures and stress reactions that we see in this population. Certainly need to also consider, uh, consider systemic conditions um, that, that we may need to refer out or involve other folks with. Osteopenia, osteoporosis, any kind of hormonal abnormalities, inadequate nutrition, and then also thinking about female athlete triad as far as low bone density, disordered eating, and amenorrhea. Um, all of those things should be red flags as far as you start seeing a whole lot of uh, stress reactions, stress fractures in, a, in an active group. <clears throat> Some of the imaging that you may see, so radiographs early on oftentimes will be clean. Um, so one of the things that I always think about is that if I'm suspicious of somebody having or, or an athlete having a, a stress reaction or stress fracture and they have clean films and they're clean, if I'm still worried about it, I'm not necessarily always so quick to clear them for full activity. Um, and I think it's important to keep in mind that radiographs may not necessarily catch some of these things early on. Um, CT can be nice from a 3D um, capability. MRI is probably the gold standard at this point. Um, I think in years past we used to see more and more bone scans. Bone scans will have a very high sensitivity but unfortunately very low specificity. So if there's anything going on at all, a bone scan will find it. The downside is it doesn't tell you what it is. It just tells you that there's something wrong. You see that uptake in and around the tissue and now typically you have to do some other test to figure out what it is that's going on. So typically people would have a bone scan. If they found something they would then need to go back and oftentimes have an MRI or some other testing. Some of the more common sites with, uh, with stress fractures, so tibia is probably the biggest, um, depending on the study, between 20 and 45 percent of all stress fractures. Um, some of the clinical thoughts or pearls here, thinking about horizontal versus vertical tenderness, so things that are running up and down along the tibia. We'll talk about medial tibial stress syndrome and others, some of the musculature components. If people are talking about pain that comes across or that horizontal plane over the tibia, um, definitely be more concerned about the possibility of a stress fracture. Um, calcaneus, more often you're going to see things lateral versus medial and posterior versus plantar. So again, if you think about the posterior lateral part of the calcaneus, there's not a whole lot going on there. When we come medial and we come plantar, we've got plantar fascia that's attaching. Um, we've got a lot of intrinsics. We've got other musculature that's coming down in that area. There's lots of things that can create pain, but oftentimes when you're looking at the posterior lateral part of the calcaneus, especially in somebody who's a heel striker, oftentimes that's where their load is going to be landing. Right? And then metatarsals can be problematic as well. Um, again, this is just coming from load, so depending on their foot mechanics. Um, people that have a, a higher arch or a, or a less mobile foot um, may put more weight on the lateral border of their foot and therefore put more weight on their fifth metatarsal compared to other regions. And if you just think of a pure anatomical standpoint, we're not meant to bear weight on the lateral part of our foot. Our fifth met is much smaller than our first. Um, and that's not by accident. We're meant to bear weight on the medial side of our body. So if folks have a more rigid foot and they can't get their weight from lateral to medial, they're overloading that fifth metatarsal. They may have a stress fracture there as well. Now where that becomes concerning is even in a healthy athletic population, it's, a, it's an area that has a fairly high incidence of non-union. Um, so a lot of times these folks can have big challenges as far as healing and then getting back to their activity. So a few studies that have looked at this population, uh, 29 women all with a history of tibial stress fracture and then they had 29 women that were matched for age and weekly running distance, so healthy controls. Um, peak rear foot eversion was greater in the tibial stress fracture group and the thinking here was that was placing a greater torsional load on the tibia itself. We also saw peak hip adduction was greater in the tibial stress fracture group, so we may see both distal as well as proximal influences here. 
And the thinking from this group was that the runners were likely utilizing frontal plane rather than sagittal plane to absorb impact forces. So I mention this study because I think that there's been lots of discussion as far as hip mechanics and hip weakness, especially when we think about the knee. But very often that's going to be a component that's going to impact things a little bit more distal as well, things like stress fractures and then certainly when we look at things even, uh, even further down in and around the foot.